Welcome back to my YouTube channel. So we have another interesting medically themed interview uh, today um, following on my previous interview about uh, the mysterious uh, condition called functional dyspepsia. We have here uh, John Damianos, MD, who is currently a resident in Yale Medical School, super interested in uh, medical education, clinical educator distinction, CED. And unlike a lot of uh, doctors and those in the medical community, John is uh, very active on Twitter. Um, his uh, Twitter hashtag is DamianosMD, and that's how uh, I came across him, sharing some really interesting stuff about the gut microbiome and the gut-brain axis, which is, of course, very relevant to FD and really uh, something John is very interested in. So, John, firstly, thank you for taking time to, uh, to speak to me today. So the question I want to start with, which might be perhaps a very loaded question, but, um, you know, this term, the gut brain axis is thrown around. Um, can you explain exactly what it is, this connection between, you know, our enteric nervous system and uh, the nervous system here in our brain and how does it work exactly? Sure. I agree that that is a loaded question, but it's a very important one. And understanding it, I, I think, opens a, a lot of doors. Uh, so the gut-brain axis is best thought of as uh, thinking of the nervous system as two sides of the same coin. So there, there's our, our our central nervous system, there's our brain, our spinal cord, I mean, there's a peripheral nervous system, like the, the nerves that allow us to feel, uh, you know, when we grab something. Uh, and our gut has its own nervous system, as you alluded to, the enteric nervous system. And this is a very extensive network of nerve cells that regulates motility of the gut, sensation in the gut contributes to digestion, and has links to the immune system, the endocrine system, and, and many other body systems. And uh, they're really, as I mentioned, two sides of the same coin, and they come from the same both evolutionary and embryologic precursors. And so in, in human development, in the womb, the central and the peripheral nervous system really come from the same progenitor tissues. And so people who have dysfunction in the central nervous system are more likely to have some sort of dysfunction in the peripheral nervous system, including the enteric nervous system, and vice versa for this reason, that they're really two sides of, of, of the same coin. And this is relevant to many disorders, but particularly the disorders of gut-brain interaction that whose pathophysiologies involve dysfunction along that relationship between the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system. And again, this, this encompasses many different aspects, including uh, a gut motility, the gut microbiota, systemic uh, and, and local inflammation and the entrainment of the immune system and uh, the, the, the endocrine system as well. So, uh, I think most gastrointestinal conditions can be thought of in light of the, the gut-brain axis. And GERD is an excellent example because the, the underlying pathophysiology of, of GERD is, is transient weakness of the lower esophageal sphincter that allows reflux of contents from the stomach mostly uh, acid from the stomach into the esophagus, uh, leading to uh, irritation and eventually erosion of the esophagus. Now, over time, that can cause irritation of the nerves in the enteric nervous system that, that, that cause sensation, that allow us to sense what's happening in the esophagus. And like any other nerve, let's say nerves on the skin, if you get a sunburn, as the sunburn's healing, your, your, your skin is very sensitive there. And so the same thing can happen. Your, your esophagus can become hypersensitive to any stimuli at all. And because you're having pain, you tend to focus on areas where you're having pain. And so people tend to have what's called esophageal hypervigilance. And they begin to have this hypersensitivity of the esophagus due to chronic irritation of the nerves. And even after the reflux is gone sometimes, they can still have this abnormal sensation, basically oversensitive nerve. So you're, you're saying that's almost like, it sounds like a sort of phantom uh, condition where the actual acid's no longer there, but you still can feel it as if it's happening right now. That's, that's a very good analogy. Another one that I use is PTSD of the gut. 
and this is relevant to, to functional dyspepsia, IBS as well, sometimes you can have an insult uh, where you have inflammation or trauma within the GI tract. And then after you leave that, you can have lasting changes to the local environment, including to, to the nerves that causes this hypersensitivity. So PTSD of the gut is another way to think about that, that type of, of phenomenon. Amazing. Um, that is super, super interesting and something uh, that actually makes me think about all of this in a whole whole new light, this idea of there being some kind of trauma and lasting response. I mean, and is there any way for, you know, for a patient to, you know, I, I presume when, when, when we're saying it's kind of a phantom sensation, whether it's that kind of, you know, FD like problems with bloating and motility or GERD, is there any way for me to know whether there's actual acid or this is just a sensation of acid or fr from a patient's perspective, does it feel pretty much the same? It can be very difficult to tease apart on, on just a symptom basis alone. The GI tract, I, 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 it's my favorite uh, organ system, and it's a very complex organ system. At the same time, I often say that it, it has a limited symptom repertoire because the GI tract can only can only s uh, signal to us that something is wrong in a few ways. It, it can have pain, it can have altered bowel habits, it can have you know, nausea, vomiting. There are really only a, a limited number of, of symptoms that, that the GI tract can produce. And because of that, many GI conditions will present with similar symptoms. And so if you look up, for instance, bloating, well, there are, there are literally hundreds of conditions that can cause bloating, gastrointestinal and non-gastrointestinal. And so symptoms alone are, are, are usually not the best way to distinguish what the underlying pathophysiology is. And this is where specialized testing can be helpful. And in, in the context of GERD and esophageal symptoms, for, for instance, th there are many types of tests that we can use to measure the acid load in the esophagus uh, to really track how much reflux is happening, how often, how many reflux events are occurring throughout the day. And then with motility as well, there are many people who who are diagnosed with, with GERD sort of empirically based on symptoms, um, but, but actually have esophageal dysmotility. And so people with, for instance, achalasia, it takes them about on average 10 years to actually get their diagnosis, which is usually done by high resolution esophageal manometry that looks at the motility of the esophagus um, because uh, that you're, you're actually using a test that, that uh, finds the underlying pathophysiology instead of just going on symptoms alone. So let me, let me ask you a question because, you know, your average patient who comes to their doctor and says, I'm, you know, getting horrible heartburn. So they're going to kind of lead the diagnostic process. They're not, you know, presenting to a tertiary center of excellence with esophageal uh, mammometry. I'm sorry, I didn't getting the name wrong. Um, does that mean that there's probably a lot of overdiagnosis of what everything looks like GERD and, you know, these more common uh, these more rare maybe conditions that actually have a more complex pathology are not going to get diagnosed because most people don't make it to those specialized, you know, uh, tests and, and treatment centers. That's definitely true. One of the, the uh, key phrases that we have in internal medicine is that common things are common. And we know that GERD is an extremely common condition within the population. It's one of the main complaints that, that comes to primary care. It's one of the main reasons for gastroenterology referral as well. And so if, if you have 100 people who are presenting with heartburn, the vast majority of them are actually going to have GERD. And so a lot of, and a lot of those people will respond to empiric therapy of GERD. We don't, we don't even need to necessarily put them through invasive testing of, of their acid levels. If they respond to acid, uh, to, to GERD therapies like acid suppression, then job well done. Now, we all need to have in the back of our minds of what happens when patients don't respond. And so that's that's where I think we can probably do a little bit better in the medical system is recognizing patients who, who are not responding to our GERD therapies and getting them to a gastroenterologist to to work up their, their refractory GERD to see if it truly is refractory GERD or if maybe we're dealing with something else like esophageal dysmotility. Very, very interesting. I think there, there's an expression that when you uh, hear hooves think horses, not zebras, right? 
Yes. I got that right? <laughs> yes. Awesome. Another, another common uh, internal medicine phrase. <laughs> so I know you are super interested in the microbiome, which is, uh, from my perspective, kind of the superstar of medicine lately. It's all over the news. Um, how does this complex world of bugs in our gut, does that affect the gut brain interact, gut brain axis? And what's the kind of interplay between these two uh, things that affect our digestive health so much? Sure, that's a great question. So our, our gut microbiota comprises uh, really trillions of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and archaea uh, that uh, live symbiotically with us. And, and they really comprise their own organ system. We really should think about the gut microbiome as its own organ system that exerts local and systemic effects. And so it does contribute to digestion via breaking down uh, uh, food and, into nutrients that, that we're uh, ingesting. Um, and another very important role of the gut microbiota is the creation of metabolic byproducts. And so a classic example is short chain fatty acids. So when, when we eat fiber, which we can think of as, as prebiotics, fiber is fertilizer for the good bacteria, I always like to say. And so when we eat fiber, our gut bacteria digest, ferment it, and, and create as a metabolic byproduct these short chain fatty acids like butyric acid and acetic acid that exert effects locally in, in the gut, protecting the gut epithelial barrier exhibiting anti-inflammatory effects. And these are also absorbed systemically and have systemic anti-inflammatory effects and have been shown to be protective against many different types of disease states, including metabolic and, and immune-mediated disorders. And so related to short-chain fatty acids and other metabolites produced by the gut microbiota, these are things that are that are absorbed into the bloodstream and distributed throughout organ systems. And, and one of those organ systems is the brain. And so this is another link that, that uh, underlies the gut-brain axis is the metabolites that the gut microbiota are producing. And so you can think if, if your, your microbiota is healthy and enriched with, with, with healthy species, with diversity, functional connectivity, you have a abundance of these healthy metabolites that preserve neurologic and psychiatric functioning. And on the flip side, if you have dysbiosis or low diversity and overabundance of pro-inflammatory bacteria, they're going to produce more toxic metabolites that can have adverse consequences systemically. So it's, it sounds like in the kind of classic chicken and egg analogy here, the chicken is the um, gut microbiome and dysbiosis and then the egg is that that's going to sort of break or impair the operation of this gut brain axis um does it work the other way around as well can you have uh problems with your motility that then sort of affect your microbiome and it all plays in is it like a vicious cycle or is it more a one directional process no one of the most important components of the gut brain axis is that it is bidirectional so the gut affects the brain and the brain affects the gut and and really the the classic sort of first study that truly identified that the brain can affect the gut is is there was a study where young healthy medical students were uh, told that were, were uh, put under endoscopy colonoscopy specifically and, and told that they had rectal cancer. And immediately they, they, they saw contractions of, of the GI tract. Their, their motility increased. There was a lot of spasm in, in the GI tract. And this, this demonstrates, that demonstrated for the first time that, that the brain can, can uh, impact through a top-down processing the functioning of the GI tract. And we've seen that from a motility standpoint, but also from the gut microbiome standpoint. And, and this is relevant to disorders of gut-brain interaction where uh, early life trauma is an important risk factor. So many, many, many people with irritable bowel syndrome, functional dyspepsia, and, and other disorders of gut-brain interaction have early life trauma or uh, have experienced physical sexual assault or other stressful life events. And the mechanism of this is, is that chronic stress can lead to dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system uh, and can impact the abundance of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And we have found that this 
does happen on the level of the microbiota as well. And there's some fascinating research of looking at top-down therapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy. And there's a suggestion that, that even cognitive behavioral therapy for disorders of gut-brain interaction can improve the gut microbiota. So it is, it is clear that top-down uh, effects also impact our, our gut microbiota. That's crazy. So um, medical students who were told they had colon cancer developed contractions characteristic of actually having it and people who received therapy and therefore, you know, lessen their burden of mental health had better, a better microbiome. So that is really, really fascinating. So it's real. It's real, guys. Um, I want to move on to a couple of super slightly more random and specific questions, but, uh, and this is not an attempt to get a free medical consultation, John. Um, <laughs> but um, I I'll send the bill. Tweet. Yeah, <laughs> after the interview. Um, I saw you tweet a couple of things um, about bile, and that kind of caught my attention because my sort of F introduction to the world of the FD club uh, came about through gallbladder, and that changes, I know, the bile stuff. So you said that's like a long standing association between um, dyspepsia and the bile acid pool being dysregulated or messed up is how I kind of translate that. Can you explain that? Do you understand why and what is that about basically? Sure. So it's, it's very common for people to develop new onset gastrointestinal symptoms after having their gallbladder removed. And there are many reasons for this. Uh, oftentimes, this is bile acid malabsorption. Um, other times, it, it's uh, related to local pain uh, in, in the area from surgery. And sometimes it, it really is a disorder of gut-brain interaction like functional dyspepsia or irritable bowel syndrome related to either antibiotics, the sort of trauma and inflammation of, of surgery um, or, or antibiotics that were given uh, with surgery as well. Antibiotics are certainly an important risk factor for dysbiosis and the development of disorders of gut-brain interaction. Now, one of the other important functions of the gut microbiota is to regulate bile acid metabolism. And in disorders of gut-brain interaction, it has been shown that patients do sometimes some, that certain patients have altered bile acid metabolism that that may be attributed to their particular composition of the gut microbiota. Now, in in functional dyspepsia specifically, there is a suggestion that uh, that some patients may have bile acid reflux after their cholecystectomy. And so cholecystectomy in general can, can lead to more bile acid reflux through changes of the, the hepatobiliary motility. Uh, and in, in patients who sort of are predisposed to this, this sort of visceral hypersensitivity or the, or the oversensitive uh, uh, nerves in the upper GI tract uh, may have more symptoms after cholecystectomy due to this bile acid reflux. And so there are several studies actually that, that have shown that some patients with functional dyspepsia have this abnormal physiology. They just have more bile that's sitting around in their stomach. And really we shouldn't have that. And that can be uh, irritating. To the nerves. Got it. Interesting. And speak, speaking of nerves, my second uh, very specific question is something that I know a lot of uh, patients are really interested in is the various antidepressants and the fact that um, it seems that for FD and also for IBS that the older tricyclics, um, amitriptyline, nortriptyline are used in these low dosages and not the newer SSRIs and SNRIs. And I've tried through my very limited ability as you know someone with Google to understand that's intriguing. Why is it that the older drugs are used does anyone actually know, or is it all kind of just um, trial and error at this point? No, the, there actually is a is a, a good uh, pathophysiological explanation for that. And, and before I go into that, I, I want to emphasize that in the GI world, we refer to these medications as neuromodulators. We prefer not to use the term antidepressants, even though they were developed as antidepressants. And the reason for that is is we're not using them to treat depression. Uh, 
that's often a, a, a favorable side effect that, that, we, that we use them for. And certainly when we treat disorders of gut-brain interaction, we want to treat the, the comorbid uh, psychiatric disorders that are very, very common in disorders of gut-brain interaction. But really we're using them as neuromodulators to impact either the central nervous system or the enteric nervous system. Because again, two sides of the same coin. 95% of our serotonin is, is made and stored in the gut, not the brain. And so medications that affect serotonin, like SSRIs, SNRIs, are going to affect the gut uh, just as much as they're affecting the brain. Now, as to why the older medications tend to have more favorable effects in disorders of gut-brain interaction, I actually have a, a, a diagram here that I think uh, is going to be very helpful for you. So, let me, Yeah, and so this comes from uh, uh, mainly... Dr. Drosman, who um, is um, uh, behind the Rome Foundation for Disorders of Gut-Brain Interactions, and he's published a lot on central neuromodulators for disorders of gut-brain interaction. And uh, the, the diagrams here specifically come from uh, the, the psychopharmacology literature that looks at the receptor targets that each of these compounds is targeting. And so as you can see here, if you, if you look at the, the TCA to, to start, you can see that it's, it's filled with all these uh, different receptors that it targets. So it, it targets serotonin receptors, norepinephrine receptors, um, uh, autonomic receptors, histaminic receptors, muscarinic receptors. So it just targets a lot of different uh, uh, receptors. I, w I want to just jump in, John, with one one really really quick explanation because I my intention is to share this with a similarly layman audience to me. So TCAs are those drugs also called tricyclics, right? It's the same same class of sorry, I was going to say antidepressants, neuro neuromodulators. Yep, exactly. And you can see at the, at the top there, at the top left, uh, that that it gives some examples of TCAs like amitriptyline, nor nortriptyline, amipramine, dizipramine. Um, and so, as you as you can see, these exert many physiologic effects due to the many receptor targets that that it has. Um, now, sort of the, the, the potential downside of this is that can lead to more side effects. And that was one of the reasons that SSRIs and SNRIs were developed, because uh, they're more targeted in their receptor cell activity. So if you look at SSRIs in that second column, and that includes things like uh, paroxetine, fluoxetine, so like, you know, sertraline and uh, um, Lexapro, for instance, um, these and I, I also, if there are any psychiatrists or psychopharmacologists watching this, I, I, I want to emphasize that this is somewhat of, a, of an oversimplification. But uh, in general, the SSRIs tend to have greater selectivity for the serotonin pathway, and they lack a lot of the other uh, receptor targets. And, th and this is great if you're treating anxiety and depression and want to reduce the, the side effect profile of the medication. Similarly, SNRIs target ser the serotonin pathway and the norepinephrine pathway. And then there are other classes uh, like the tetracyclics, which, which again uh, have, have more receptor targets. And so because of, of this, um, we, for, for neuromodulators, uh, tend to use things like TCAs and the so-called atypical antidepressants because of these other receptors that they're targeting. Remember that gut motility involves some of these other receptors, like the autonomic receptors uh, uh, that the TCAs are, are targeting. And so for that reason, we, we, there's better data for these than for the SSRIs and SNRIs, and particularly for painful conditions. And so a second figure here from Dr. Drossman, again, uh, helps us determine what types of symptoms are going to respond better to uh, what types of medications. And so again, SSRIs uh, tend to be for kind of when, when anxiety and depression are, are really prevalent uh, in the patient's presentation, whereas TCAs are more favorable for pain. Um, and then the second uh, uh, half, the bottom half of this slide, talks about 
augmentation when we can use uh, other types of neuromodulators based on their receptor profiles and their side effect profiles to help patients with, again, you know, particular symptoms. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I think about uh, using neuromodulators in patients is what type of symptom are they actually experiencing? What types of symptoms are they experiencing? And in my arsenal of many different potential agents of neuromodulators, what receptor profile is best going to help their unique presentation? Super interesting. So I guess the 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 really sort of uh, summary version I'm going to give is because these earlier antidepressants were less selective, that made them ironically less good for uh, psychiatric disorders, but you actually want that kind of broad array of uh, the histamine receptor and uh, all the other ones they kind of bounce off. Exactly. We're targeting pain, we're targeting motility, so that there's just more that's beneficial for disorders of gut brain interaction there. I'm so I'm so excited to finally have an answer. I've been I've been wondering that for like a year and I know there's lots of people doing it. So I'm sure um that'll be very much appreciated. Um because I think as patients, you know, often um and personally my family doctor is really on top of the research. Uh, and, you know, he wasn't surprised to see amitriptyline being used for stomach. But I do think that a lot of older doctors kind of say, oh, we don't use those drugs, the tricyclics anymore. They're, you know, they're old school. Um, and I've seen through, again, my own Googling that there is really good research for their use. I mean, I think it's, I, there's, it's also, I think uh, there's an economic advantage in the sense that these drugs are all on generic now. So in the developing world, I understand that they're, they're actually still very much the kind of first line, even for psychiatric stuff. So that's awesome as well. Um, I want to close with one question. Um, I know you are, you're clearly hugely interested in gastroenterology and you told me that's what you're going into. Um, are you, you know, you're interested in functional, all these functional disorders. Um, What's your feeling? Are you kind of optimistic regarding uh, what's coming down the pipeline for treatment based on what you've seen about our understanding or how do you kind of feel uh, the treatment of these is going to uh, evolve over the coming uh, couple of decades? I'm very optimistic about uh, about the future of disorders of gut-brain interaction. And I think we've seen a major shift even within my own lifetime of people's attitudes and research efforts to understanding these conditions. I think in the past there was this mistaken dismissal of these conditions as essentially manifestations of, of psychiatric disease and, and just, so just sort of very little interest from the side of, of primary care and gastroenterology to manage these conditions. But through more and more emerging evidence, it's, it's very clear that that this sort of organic functional dichotomy is is very superficial and misses so much of the nuance of the brain body connection and and we've and even with the terminology change with the Rome 4 uh, consensus from functional GI disorders to disorder of gut brain interaction that that better describes the underlying uh, pathophysiology and granted there's a long way to go there's so much that we don't understand about these disorders but there's so much encouraging research of 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 trying to figure out where these symptoms come from the the basic mechanisms from kind of a cellular and molecular level and then trying to identify unique pathophysiologic contributors in each patient i think that my, my personal opinion is is that things like irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia are really umbrella terms for symptoms. Again, the GI tract has a very limited symptomatology that it can use to tell us that something is going wrong. And so a lot of things are going to present similarly. And so I think to use again the, the bile acid reflux example, I think, I think some people with FD have bile acid reflux. Some people have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Some people have more dysmotility. And there's going to be a lot of overlap, but I think the future is really going to be uh, is going to be nailing down pathophysiologic abnormalities in, in each patient to figure out the best treatment for them. And that's one of the challenges now is that we we do have good medications for functional dyspepsia, IBS, etc., uh, that work really well for some patients and not at all for other patients. So, and why, why is that? Well, it's probably because you're targeting different aspects of the pathophysiology. And so I think the future is really going to be 
how do we distinguish what's actually causing this patient's unique presentation of IBS, FD, et cetera, so that we can better target our, our treatment? Essentially, personalized medicine. That is good. I always like to end on an optimistic note. So more, um, and I also caught that you're saying functional um, is on the way out is terminal. I, I know the Rome Foundation does amazing work in this regard. So uh, if we have any consolation, at least that, because it, it's, it always strikes me as kind of a ironic terminology when uh, often it's actually the fact that the the system seems to have stopped functioning when you get one of these functional disorders, but uh, that that's good to know as well. Um, so John, if people want to keep on top of your, um, output and interest and research, I'm getting, I'm guessing Twitter is the best place to do that, but any, anywhere else that, that might be of interest. Yeah. So I think uh, GI Twitter is, is uh, a wonderful place to keep up with the latest in GI knowledge. I'm at John underscore Damianos MD, and there are, are many, many other, uh, folks out there who are doing phenomenal work and, and, and publishing great research. I think that's a great place to, to start. The Rome Foundation has excellent resources uh, for disorders of gut-brain interaction, um, and there are many other advocacy groups that, that, um, that also create great patient-facing content in the space. With GI Twitter too, there there are organizations like Tuesday Night IBS that that has that links to patients and providers to have discussions about uh, relevant topics and disorders of the gut brain interaction. And so there, there's just kind of more and more uh, excitement and activity in in this space. And so I'd say start with Twitter and the Rome Foundation, and 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 there are a lot of doors that will open up open up from there. Cool. And I want to say for anyone else who's watching this video. At my level, I find John's Twitter super interesting because of the fact that he shares these, you know, crazy complicated medical papers, but you actually break it down um, in a way that I think a lot of interested people, probably mostly people who have these things, because if you don't have IBS or FD, you probably have other things on your mind than the gut microbiome. But if you are engaged in the space, um, I think your, your, Twitter, your Twitter feed strikes a really great balance. Uh, and I definitely really recommend it. So John, thank you very much uh, for talking um, with me and uh, best of luck with all your research, learning, and uh, of course, also medical Twitter. Well, thank you very much. I, I truly appreciate it. And it's been a, a real pleasure.